All right, well, I invite you to turn to 1 Samuel 24. That's the passage we're going to be in this morning. We've started a series on how to study the Bible, and um, today's message will be much like last week, a little bit of teaching and a little bit of application of how, how do we study the Bible. Um, if you haven't been with us, uh, the short of it is this. Your Bible is put together um, in some ways that uh, it's pretty important to understand how it's, it's put together in order to study it a certain way. If you want to connect with God, if you want to be in a place where you open your Bible and go, oh, it, I want to connect with God, and sometimes we just don't know how. Sometimes it's just, it's too big a book. We get confused by it. We're like, where do I even start? Um, we kind of get overwhelmed by it, and uh, sometimes we're like, I read this, I don't even know what it says. So my goal is to really make the Bible um, accessible and to make it something that you feel like you can connect with, and when you open it up, you know how to connect with God. Your, your Bible has got uh, several different genres to it, and what I mean, it's written in different ways. God communicates truth in several different ways in the Bible. He communicates truth through poetry. You'll see that there's uh, several books in the Bible where it's written in its poetry. You can find like Job, um, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Psalms. There, there's this aspect of, of how God communicates his truth through, through poetry and stuff like that. There's other sections that are are more commonly known, like the teaching literature, which is more like uh, Paul's writings and John's writings and James' writings, the the letters. And and what that's uh, done is is we we read those, and it's pretty easy to understand because it's pretty uh, understandable to see, hey, here's point one, here's sub-point two, and sub-point three, and we kind of work our way through it. But a good portion of your Bible is actually narrative, meaning God is communicating a truth through a story. He's making his truth known through a story, and a good portion of the Bible is actually story. And we don't want to study story in the way that we study a letter from Paul or a letter from James, because it it doesn't work that way. And we're not commonly taught what to do with stories. And so very often we read these stories and we kind of blow through them and we're like, okay, that's a cool story, but I don't know what else I got from it, but I didn't get that much out of it. Uh, Maybe it's a a cool little thing to to remember, but uh, how do I get the point out of a story? And when most of your Bible is actually story, it's a tragedy when we don't know how to study story. Because the aspect of the story makes the Bible come to life. This is where the truth of God is so applicable to our lives because we see people living out truths of God. We see people making mistakes. We see people interacting with God in real life circumstances. It's something we should be able to relate to. It's something where we should be able to say, hey, this is how God uh, shows up in my life. It's very practical. And so I I want us to know how to study these different genres in Scripture, and we're just starting with narrative lit. We're starting with narrative lit where God expresses the truth through a story. I've given you some tools about how to do that. We're going to do a few things. We're studying story. And so this is just a reminder of what we're doing. Actually, you know what? We're going to do something. I'm going to see what we remember from last time. We did pretty good last week. We're going to do three Ps. If we're going to study a story, we have to do three Ps. Does anybody remember what I I said was the three Ps? What's the first P? Paint Paint the picture, right? We want to paint the picture. We want to put ourselves in the story. We want to imagine being there. We want to be like a movie director. What are the sights? What are the sounds? What are the actual um, details of the story? We want to place ourselves there because we, we want to be able to be in the story. The second P, what is it? Put ourselves in the shoes of uh, as many characters as possible. I think I heard some people say that. So great, we've got two Ps. We paint the picture, then we put ourselves in the shoes of the characters. Because if we put ourselves in the shoes, what we do is we use our imagination. What would it be like to be them? What would it be like to be in this situation? What would it be like to be this person in, in this circumstance? Because when we ask that question and we start to put ourselves in their shoes, we start to feel it. When we start to feel it, we begin to see how God might be communicating to us and we see how we might respond. And it opens us up to experience the story and the truth of the story starts to come out for us. And the application of the story also comes out because we placed ourselves there and we pretended in our minds and used our imagination like, what would it have been like to be them? What would we be afraid of? What would we be thinking about? What would we be excited about? What questions would we have? What would cause us to move in this moment? What would cause us not to move in this moment? As we, as we put ourselves in the shoes, it comes to life. Our third P, does anybody remember what our third P is? Principle. We're looking for a timeless truth. Something that was true in their day would also be true in our day. If we do those three things, the story is going to come to life. And the story will be applicable, and it will be something we apply to our own lives. Those are the first three things we want to do. Then there's two questions we want to do. Anybody remember one of the questions? It's okay. I mean, I didn't remember one last week, remember? Um, But uh, if you don't, here's the two questions. 
Every story is asking a question, and every story is answering a question. So we want to ask this question, what is the story asking or answering? As I pointed out last week, movies um, and stories don't usually come out and tell you the point. They aren't usually saying in, in the story, like, hey, here's the point of the whole story. It's inferred. It's there. And you experience the story as you, as you watch a movie or you read a good novel as you're, you're there and carried along through it. It becomes obvious a little bit as you go through it, like what the point is. But they never really usually tell you. Sometimes they do, but not always. So we want to ask, what's the story asking? What's it answering? The second question is, why is the story told in the way it's told? Because the, the story is told in a certain way to get us to see certain things. And that last question, why is the story told in the way it's told, that's where we looked at Genesis 24. Because in Genesis 24, we saw a story that was written and it was twice as long as it needed to be. What was the purpose of it being written that way? It was because of testimony. And if you want to you know, circle back on our website, you can hear that message. But that's where we dove into why is the story told in the way it's told and why asking that question can be really important. Well, this morning, what we're going to do is we'll do the three Ps because we're going to do that every week. But we're really going to focus on what's the story asking or answering? Because when you ask that question, um, the story will come to life. And we're going to look at 1 Samuel 24 with a uh, focus of why is this, well, what is the story asking and what's it answering? So I don't know if any of you got a chance to go through 1 Samuel 24 on your own. The sheet that I handed out to you is a way to begin to go through a passage of Scripture that's narrative in nature, a story, and begin to work your way through. First page, I think, is going to you, paint the picture. It gives you a little chart, a way to kind of paint the picture. Second page, which is on the back, tells you, you know, how I'm going to place myself in the shoes of the different characters. What would it be like to be them? Your third page is a principle. It's just a way to kind of go through it. And it has the two questions there. So I'm going to, you know, invite you to do that this week if you'd like. Not with this chapter. We're going to do 1 Samuel 24 today. So next week, we're going to do Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. And um, there's several stories in Mark chapter 8. But just want you to go through Mark chapter 8. I'm going to preach through Mark chapter 8 next week. Okay? Um, so that, there's our, our prep for next week. If you want to do that, great. That's where you're really going to learn how to study story because you get a chance to do it on your own. I'm going to preach it, and you're like, oh, I understand what's happening. And you might even have some things to contribute and some things that you might be able to add and some things that I missed. Or you might even say, oh, I'm not sure if I see that. Um, but it's, it's a way for you to, to engage. So Mark chapter 8, okay? This week, though, 1 Samuel 24. Remember that this week, it's really, what's the story asking and answering? Let me, uh, let me read our story first, and then we'll, we'll work our way through the three Ps. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. I just want you to know, Saul is the king of Israel. David is also the anointed king of Israel. David has been anointed by God to become the next king of Israel because Saul has screwed up. Saul has walked away from God. Saul has not obeyed God. And Saul did not obey God for a long time. Because Saul did not obey God for a long time, God ripped the kingdom out of his hands. He sent a prophet to him. And uh, the prophet told him that God was taking the kingdom out of his hands. And he was going to give it to another. When God gave it to another and gave it to David, David is now the anointed king of Israel. And Saul is not dead yet, so Saul is still the anointed king of Israel. And you've got two anointed kings by God for Israel. There can be some tension. Saul does not want to lose his kingship, though he already has. David is about to become king, but he's not king yet. He is the anointed king by God, but Israel does not recognize him as their king yet. So they live in tension. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, the appropriate enemy of the Israelites, he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. Now let me give you a little bit of additional background. When it says that Saul is looking for David, it's because he wants to kill him. He tries to kill him about eight different times um, because he doesn't like that David is going to become king. He's not happy about this, so he actually tries to kill him about eight different times. This is one of those times. So he comes after him. He's coming after him and says, with 3,000 chosen men. So when we're painting our picture, here's the first thing. He's got 3,000 chosen men. Now, if you're the king of Israel and you've got an army, I mean, there's an army and then there's the chosen. And so your army and then the chosen, the chosen are like the best of the best. You know, I don't want to put any branch of our military down, but it's like, you know, the Marines like to think that they're the best of the best. Or the Navy SEALs, you know, or, or it's 
a, a group that's elevated, the rangers and all, all that kind of stuff. So th these, these are the people that are, are the strongest warriors, the most um, looked up to, and, and they're the strongest. So when, when Saul takes 3,000 chosen, he's going after David, not just with some, some people in his army. No, he's got the best of the best. I'm going to end this today. And so he sets off because he's heard that David is in the desert of En Gedi. Once he hears that David is in the desert of En Gedi, he's like, I'm going, and 3,000, you're coming with me. This is going to end today. Verse 3, he, being Saul, came up to the sheep pens along the way, and a cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed. And we'll leave it there. Just for attention. It's a story. It's a story. We've got to fill it. We've got, we got to place ourselves in the shoes of the different characters here, and we've got to paint the picture. So Saul is coming with 3,000 men. David and his men, we find out, are in the cave, and they're far back in a cave. David and his men are, are far back in the cave, and 3,000 men aren't quiet. You can hear footsteps, which isn't really footsteps. You can hear marching. You can hear the feet pounding, and 3,000 of them, which means 6,000 feet hitting the ground in unison. You can hear the rattling of um, spears and swords. You can hear shields. You can hear the armor. You can hear it. They're like you're in the back of the cave, and you can hear this coming and approaching. And, and you can, can hear it as, as they're kind of moving along. There's a, some speed to it, and then all of a sudden it starts to slow down because it's, um, he comes to the, the sheep pens, and it says that, that he slows down. And then it says, uh, that basically Saul's going to take a bathroom break. So when kind of you're, you're traveling, all of a sudden someone's got to take a pee break. Well, this is what Saul's got to do. So Saul's looking for a place to go. He's got to find a, you know, a, a safe place to do that. He's like, well, I'm just going in that cave. And so he, he makes his way up to the cave. But I want you to place yourself in the shoes of David and his men at this point because David and his men can hear all this commotion. And then they can hear some stillness. And then they can hear someone coming and making their way and kicking against the rocks and the dirt as they make their way up to the entrance of the cave. And if they're in the back of the cave, their eyes are adjusted to the darkness, but as they look out and they can see a shadowy figure at the front of the cave. And they begin to see him walk in. Now, what are you feeling if you're one of these 600 men that belong to David? You've been on the run. David had been trying, I mean, Saul's been trying to kill David and you all, the 600 who are with him. And you see this shadowy fear enter into the cave. Does fear enter in? What's he going to do? Are we going to be found? Is he going to search the cave? And he walks in, kind of turns to a wall, and starts to get himself in a position to relieve himself. And in that spot, all of a sudden, you've got relief that comes over you. Oh, he's not searching. He's going to the bathroom. And you're one of the 600 men, and here's what the 600 men say. David, David, this is the day. This is the day. This is the day the Lord said he was going to deliver your enemy in your hands. Go kill him. He's by himself. He's proverbially caught with his pants down. We got him. And so they encourage him. And David hears, this is the day. And place yourself in David's shoes like, yeah, this guy's tried to kill me a bunch of times. Here he is. You're right. This is the day. I, I, he's in my hands. And so David creeps forward slowly in a way that he can't be seen or recognized. He makes his way quietly up. And being one of the 600 men in the background, here's what you see. As a knife goes. And if you're one of those 600 men, go ahead. Whew. We're on the run. No more. Relief. 
And David picks something up. He starts walking towards him. And he gets really close. And when he gets close, what they see in his hand isn't the head of the king. It's the corner of his robe. This is our scene. Now, if you're one of the 600 men, how do you feel when he doesn't come with the head of the king? He comes with just the corner of the robe. Let's keep reading. This is the day the Lord spoke, verse 4, when he said to you, I'll give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he's the anointed of the Lord. And with these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. So let's paint that scene and we'll put ourselves back in the shoes of the carriage a little bit. So David comes back forward with something in his hand. And when they see it's not the head of the king, but they say it's just the corner of the robe. I think there was 600 men that did this. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? For years, we've been by your side. For years, we've left our families and our homes and our comfort. We've been chased just like you. Are you kidding me? This is the day you get a a chance to take him out and to bring us into safety, and you don't do it. Are you kidding me? Now, now why do I think it's, are you kidding me? Because it says that David rebukes them. Do you see that? He rebukes them. (coughs) So David says this, the Lord forbid that I lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. And David's heart is so sensitive, he's conscience stricken over cutting his robe. He's like, I can't believe I cut his robe. And what David is like, yeah, I know I'm the anointed king, but so is he. And I can't treat him that way. The Lord forbid that I touch uh, or lay a hand against him. And so he rebukes his men. And so all his men are going, and they're also doing this. If you're not going to do it, I'm going to do it. And you know what? When one person said this, he goes, the hell you are, I'm going to do it. And all 600, no, we're all going to do it. And they're ready to chase and they're ready to charge him. And David rebukes his men. He rebukes them. It says, the Lord forbid that I lay a hand and he forbids that you do. And you better not. And he won't let him do it. And I'm going to read the rest of the story and then we'll... Uh, do our three Ps again. Verse 8. Then David went out of the cave and called to Saul, my lord the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lift my hand against my master because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe but did not kill you. Now understand and recognize I'm not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me. May the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You're more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me of the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David gave his oath to Saul. Then Saul returned home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. That's the rest of our story. And before I get back into imagining what it's like to be some of these different people, what we're doing and focusing on is, you remember every story, 
asks a question and answers one. Now, I told you that stories don't often tell you what the point is. They don't often tell you what the question is. They don't often tell you what the answer is. Well, this story did. Did you catch it? This story actually asks the question right in front of us. It is explicit in the story itself. It's one of the reasons why I picked this one. If we're going to say, what's the story asking or answering? Well, this story actually asks a question. What's it asking? When a man finds his enemy, this is verse 19, when a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? It's right there in the text. Here's our question. Well, guess what? This story answers that question. It's answering, when a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? So we want to find out, how? How does this story answer that question? Because every story is asking a question, and every story is answering a question, and you're not going to ask a question and not answer it. And the point of this story is driven home by understanding the answer to this question. Because what God wants us to know today is, when a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? Or said very specifically to us, When you find your enemy, do you let them get away unharmed? An enemy can be a strong word, but when you find someone who has uh, wronged you, done something against you, sinned against you, when you have someone that you just don't like, someone who has uh, robbed you of things or kept something from happening to you, if if there's someone in your life that you're just angry at and you've harbored anger and bitterness towards, uh, there's your enemy. When a man or a woman finds a person like that and they've got the chance to take them out, do they? And Saul is astounded by David's actions, and he asks the question, when a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? Now, here's how Saul wants to answer that question. No, he doesn't, because I've been chasing you forever, and I've been wanting to kill you, and I've tried so many times. If I found you, you'd be dead. You found me, I'm not. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? Don't miss how important this question is for us this morning. Let's go back into our story, though, because there's two scenes to our story. The first scene is this one in the cave where David has to rebuke his men, but the second scene is the one outside the cave where David is with Saul. And so we find in verse 8, David went out of the cave, and he called out to Saul. Now, now here's the thing. Saul is in the cave. He thinks he's by himself. That's why he went in there. He went in there to relieve himself. He leaves. He's made his way down. And then he hears someone call him, Saul. I don't know, but you may be a little startled. I, I didn't know anyone was there. Like, and, and you turn around, and, and you see, like, oh, my gosh, this is David. So it says, David went out of the cave, and he called out, Saul, my lord, my king. And Saul looked behind him, and David was bowed down and prostrated to it. So here, here's David. Um, he's like this. Now think about that for a second. How humble is that? I don't know how much, if you're in the back, if you can really see, but he's got his neck exposed. The man who wants to kill him, he bows before him, exposes the back of his neck. Humble, gentle. He doesn't come at him like this and go, Saul, what are you doing? No, he comes up and approaches him humbly. This is a very important principle here about how we approach people who have wronged us. And, and David approaches him very humbly very gently, and he's about to call Saul out, but before he does that, he puts himself in a posture to be heard, because by coming humbly, he places himself in a posture that he could be heard, because all of a sudden, Saul might start to listen to him a little bit, and so here's what we find that David says, with his face to the ground, he said to Saul, why do you listen when men say, David is bent on harming you? This day you've seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered me into your hands, or delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lift my hand against the, my master because he's the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner. I was so close, I could have done it. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. Now, understand and recognize that I'm not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I've not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him go to unharmed? I told you this story is answering that question. And I don't know if you caught it, but the first answer to our question is right here in what David just said. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him go to unharmed? Well, David did for one reason. 
See, the answer is this. It depends. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? It depends. It depends on who you're listening to. Did you catch that? Because David, in his response to Saul, says, why are you listening to men when they say I'm bent on harming you? Today, some people urged me to kill you. What's happening here is David is saying this. You were in the cave. You were my enemy. I could have taken you out. And you know what? People wanted me to. It depends. It depends on who you listen to. And so David says very specifically to Saul, "Why?" this is verse 9, he said to Saul, why do you listen when men say? If you're going to take your enemy out, it depends on who you're listening to. People are going to tell you, take out your enemy. People are going to tell you, this is the time to take vengeance. People are going to tell you, you got to protect yourself and take your own life into your own hands, and if there's your enemy, take him out. Never miss a chance to take your enemy out. That's what men would say. What was it? mankind would say. And so David has this exact same thing, because David's in the cave, and 600 of his men are saying, hey, this is the day. This is the day the Lord told you he was going to deliver it into your hands to see what you would do. And, and you know, I don't know if that's actually true or not. Because the Bible doesn't say any point that David received that message from the Lord. But his men say that. So it's possible that David had recounted that, hey, look, guys, I know we're on the run, but one day God's going to deliver, deliver us from this and he's going to put the enemy in our hands. So it, it's okay. I don't really know what happened there. I just know that the men are saying this. And it's quite possible that it's still true. David, I'm going to see what's in your heart. Do you want to kill him or not? But then his men are saying, this is the day. Go kill him. And if David had listened to them, Saul would be dead. But somewhere along the line, from leaving his 600 men to getting close to him, he started to hear the spirit of the Lord. And he was reminded, the Lord forbid I lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. I can't kill him. So in that moment, he's like, well, I'm not going to kill him, but I'll just take a corner of his robe. And then on his way back with the corner of the robe, he's like, I can't believe I did that. Man, I, I still laid a hand on him. See the softness of David's heart? He's listening to the Lord instead of to people. Now when he confronts Saul, he says, why do you listen? Why do you listen to people when they say David is bent on harming you? I'm not. Today you can see I had a chance to kill you, and I didn't. I'm not. Why are you listening to them? Saul, you better start listening to God because you're not. You're listening to them, and they're going to take you the wrong way. Does a man let his enemy get away unharmed? Well, it depends. It depends on what you're listening to. If you and I place ourselves in a position to hear the Lord, the way we respond to people who wrong us will be very different. If we put ourselves in a position to continue to listen to the Lord when we're wronged, when people have sinned against us, when people have taken things from us, when people have hit us in the mouth, when we listen to the Lord about how to respond, we'll respond differently. But if we're listening just to the ways of the world, we'll take our enemy out. And we all have enemies. We all have someone who is doing something against us. To varying degrees, I understand that it may not be as extreme as this. But what will we do? And you know what? People will kill people over greater things than this. People will um, do great harm to people over much less than what Saul is doing to David. And, and even if you don't kill somebody, there are things that we will do to bring harm to someone else because they've wronged us. It depends. Who are you listening to? It'll depend. So in your life and in my life, I have to ask this question, will I let my enemy get away unharmed? Well, it depends. And I can tell you there have been many times in my life, and it happens a lot, where I'm presented with the opportunity to take someone out or to listen to the Lord. And every, every time it happens, you have to choose to tune in, and you have to choose to tune out. You tune in the Lord, and you tune out of the ways of the world to take out your enemy. You have to. David, in his encounter with Saul, he, he continues. He says, um, well, for context, I'll just start in verse 11. See, my father, look at this piece of robe in your hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. Now understand and recognize I'm not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I've not wronged you. You're hunting me down to take my life. 
May the Lord judge between you and me. And may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? And we'll get that later. There are two points here about how to answer the question. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? There's two more. The first one depends on who you're listening to. It also depends on who you want to be. Who do you want to be? See, David says it this way. From evil doers come evil deeds. That's his words right right there in verse uh, 13. From evil doers come evil deeds. So my hand won't touch you. Who do you want to be? See, when we are faced with our enemy, who do we want to be? Do we want to be like them who are wronging us, or do we want to be like the Lord? Who do you want to be? And David is saying, Saul, I don't want to be evil. I don't want to be wicked, and I don't want to take you out. I mean, I know you want to, but that's not who I want to be. I want to be something different. I want to be like the Lord. My heart's for the Lord, and it's not for me. I don't try to protect myself. I am in the place of saying, I want to be like the Lord, and that's who I want to be like, and I'm not doing it. So when you and I are faced with an enemy, and we're faced with the question, do we let it get away unharmed? It depends on who you want to be. And we don't often think about that in that moment. We aren't thinking about this is our character. We aren't thinking about this is who I want to be as a person. We aren't thinking about how, all we can think about, how do I protect myself and how do I get back at them? But if you respond that way, it speaks about who you want to be. And in that moment, what we're challenged with or faced with is who do we want to be in that moment? Do I, do I really want to be the person who takes someone out? Do I really want to be the person who, who uh, for spite, just hits them back and punches them in the mouth in, in some way? Do I want to be that person? Or do I want to be kind? Do I want to be gentle? Do I want to be patient? Do I want to be uh, abounding in love? Do I want to be slow to become angry? Do I want to be quick to listen? Um, do I, do I, who do I want to be? Do I want to be gentle? Do I want to be meek, which is strength under control? It's not weak, it's meek. I've got the strength to do it, but I'm not going to. It's much greater strength to restrain oneself than to exert it towards someone else. Do you want to be strong? Do you want to be like the Lord? Do you want your character to be refined in this moment? Do you want the Lord to be on display in this moment? What do you want people to see and who do you want to be? See, how we respond to this question, when a man finds his enemy, does he let him go unharmed? It depends who you're listening to and who you want to be. And I told you there's a, a third point here, and I'm going to catch that third point by continuing to read because he, he basically this third point is pretty important. He kind of says it twice. So we, we've already caught it once, and I'm going to keep reading, and we'll catch it in a second. Verse 14, against whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You're more righteous than I, he said. You've treated me well, but I've treated you badly. You have just now told me of the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for what way you've treated me today. See, if you're confronted with your enemy and you, you've got a chance to take your enemy out, do you let him go unharmed? Well, there's a third reason why it depends. It depends on who you're listening to. It depends on who you want to be. And it depends on if you believe that God is, your ju- is the one who judges between you and someone else. If you believe that God's the one who can vindicate you, if you believe God will be your defender, or if you believe you have to be. See, if you believe that God can be your defender, you don't have to do it. If you believe God can be your vindicator, you don't have to do it. If you believe that God cares for you, who protects you and he'll provide for you, you don't have to do it. If you believe that God is for you and not against you, if you believe that God works all things together for the good of those that love him, if you believe these things, then you will not respond in a way that says, I have to take care of this. So what David does is he says, I'm not going to judge between me and you. I'm going to listen to the Lord, not them. I don't want to do it. I don't want to be a wicked person. I'm not going to do it. And on top of that, the Lord's going to judge between me and you. I'm not. I'm not going to be the judge. I'm going to let him be it. He'll vindicate me. He'll judge between me and you. 
Now, here's the deal. If you know that that's what God does, that he vindicates and that he'll be the judge between us, this is why I don't want to be the wicked person. And it's also why I want to make sure I'm listening to him. Because if I don't listen to him, and if I choose to go down that wicked path instead, then I erase God's ability to vindicate me. I erase God's ability to lift me up and to provide for me what he wants to do in my life. God was doing something in David's life, and here's what he's doing. And he wouldn't know it, and David wouldn't know it. But David does know this. He's anointed king of Israel, and God is using several years. I think it might be 13 to 18 years. I forget how long. Um, But there's a whole period here where he's anointed king but not yet really king. And God's using all these things to build his character so that David has the character to carry the anointing. See, very often in our lives, God wants to do something for us. And what he wants to do requires the character to carry it. And all these different things in David's life is producing the character in David to carry it. And David's saying, I'm not going to judge between me and you. I'm going to let the Lord do it. And from here, we learn a principle about how to handle anger and how to handle our enemy. So again, we do three Ps. We paint the picture. We put ourselves in the shoes of the different characters. Um, you, you can see how Saul being to react. He weeps aloud. Is that you? I can't believe you did this for me. See, the impact that David has on Saul. Now, here, here's the deal. Let's talk about principle for a second. So it depends on three things, and, and those are three really good principles, I think. But here's what's also happening. See, when you've got an enemy, and let's just pretend this is the neck of an enemy. This is the neck of someone who... Uh, has wronged us, done something to us, has come against us, and it's someone we're angry with. And, and when we have a chance to get them, like whether, whether we got a chance to get them or not, we imagine getting them. We imagine like, oh, the day when I can get my hands around that one. Whether it's uh, proverbial or literal, like I just want to take this person out. And if we're presented with the opportunity to take them out, what we want to do is just want to kind of, I just want to do that to you. That's what I want to do. And see, this is what Saul wants to do to David. He's looking for the chance to put David in his hands. He's looking for the chance to just get him. David's men say, this is the day the Lord has uh, presented for you to go and take him out. And his men want him to do this. See, this is what people want. And this is a natural response from from a, a human standpoint to say, hey, go get your enemy. See, it doesn't make sense to let your enemy go. It's why Saul asked the question, when a man finds his enemy, does he let him go in harm? No, everybody does this. See, what David says is this. Yeah, he does. If he's listening to the Lord, if he knows who he wants to be, and if he believes that God's the judge. And so what David did is he doesn't let David get, or he doesn't let Saul get off scot-free. He doesn't. This is, just illustration. David doesn't do this. He didn't do that. Don't read it this way. This is not what he did. David did this. Here you go, God. You take him. He didn't drop him and act like nothing happened. He handed him to God. David also confronted Saul and let him know, hey, what you're doing is wrong. So he didn't just forget about it and not confront him. He still says, what are you doing here? See, David could have just stayed in the cave and let him go on his way and just like, okay, we got out of that one. No, David confronts Saul, his enemy, and lets him know what you're doing is wrong. And by confronting him, it has an impact on Saul. So there is an aspect of confrontation. So it wasn't just like, hey, I'm going to act like it didn't even happen. That's not in the story. This is in the story. Here you go, God. And putting him in God's hands. And if we just let this be God for a second. There you go. Now, here's the deal. That's a really hard thing to do. This is a really hard thing to do. And you know what's also hard? Letting it stay there. See, some of us will be like, oh, this is great. I feel like I can do that, and I'll do this. I'm like, here you go, God. Get it. And then some time goes by, and we don't really feel like God got them. And so then we just do this. Well, I'll bring that back. I don't think you're doing a good enough job. And we'll put them back in our hands. Watch out for that. It happens. 
because we don't think God is taking care of us the way we thought. And here's what happens very often. And I want you to know this. You got to know this. Very often when you do this and they're in God's hands, do you know what God tends to do? Do you know who God is? He's kind. He's gentle. He's forgiving. He's patient. He's long-suffering. And he gives grace. And so you know what happens? We read this story and go, oh, great. Smite him, God. And you know what? He doesn't. Sometimes he does. But most often he doesn't. And what happens, we get very confused. Like, why didn't you get him? And in case you're confused here, two chapters after this, Saul tries to kill him again. Just so you know. David did this. Here you go, God. And in two chapters, Saul right after him again, trying to kill him all over again. What's the deal with that? The thing is that God's a giver of grace, and I'm really glad he is. He's given me so much grace. He's given me so much kindness. He's given me so much patience where I haven't really figured it out. He has told me things, and I'm like, okay, yeah, God, I'm so sorry about that. That's not the way you want me to live. And then I've done it again. And he still gives me grace, and he still gives me patience, and he still gives me kindness. This is the way he treats me. And guess what? If I put someone else in God's hands, he's going to do the same thing for them, most likely. And God is a giver of grace. And God is a patient God. It doesn't mean that he won't vindicate. It doesn't mean that God won't step in. But God is a God who is patient and kind and grace-filled and forgiving. And if you put someone over here, be prepared that that will probably be what they get. Now, here's the deal. God gives grace. Now, hear this. Until he doesn't. Until he doesn't. And by that I mean that this is, there's a thing about God. He has grace and he is abundant in grace. He's abundant in love and he's slow to become angry. But he, and he gives grace. But he gives grace until he doesn't. And what it means is that basically God is a patient God and he will give us grace and he'll give us chance after chance after chance. But if we just won't turn, eventually, someday, we just don't know when, and someday he's going to say, you're done. And so Saul has chased David and tried to kill him like eight different times. It's spanning several different years. And in that place, there comes a day, and even after this, like I told you, two chapters later, he tries to kill him again. There comes a day when God judges Saul. So he gave Saul patience. He gave him a chance to change his heart. He showed him what a heart would look like that was after him. He used David to say, Saul, wake up. This is not what I have for you. He put David in Saul's life to say, this is what it looks like to carry the anointing of the Lord and to be the king of Israel, and you haven't gotten it. And God does not give up on Saul. He removes the kingdom from him. But he still is after his heart and is after his character and he gives him time to turn around and shows him, hey, be like David. And Saul gets all these chances for a very long time. And this feels like a very long time when David puts him in God's hands. But the day does finally come when God says to Saul, no more. And in battle, Saul ends up taking his own life because he couldn't bear the thought of someone else taking it. With that said, God gives grace until he doesn't. And when you put someone else in God's hands, he'll vindicate you. I just don't know when. And vindication can look in two different ways. It can look like the sadness of Saul's life ending. Or it could look like Saul's heart changing and saying, my gosh, why did I do this to you? I can't believe I did that to you, and I want to be for you. See, there's a guy in this story that's actually not in the story. He's never mentioned. But his name is Jonathan. Jonathan is the son of Saul. As the son of Saul, he's the prince and supposed to be the next king. But he doesn't get to be king because his dad is wicked and evil. And when God took the kingdom out of Saul's hand... He also took it out of Jonathan's hand. And Jonathan has a chance to be bitter and angry. He has a chance to put David in his hands. But Jonathan doesn't. Because Jonathan says, David is a man after God's heart. And my heart's after God's heart. I want to be friends with that guy. And so even though Jonathan doesn't get to be king, what Jonathan does, he does everything to support David to become king. What could have happened if there was a change in Saul's heart? 
to say, David, I don't get to be king anymore, but you do. Come here. Let me show you what you need to know, and let me help you be the best king you can be. See, that's vindication too. Vindication isn't always taking them out. Vindication, the best kind, is a change of heart and a repentance. A heart like Jonathan's. And so when we put someone in God's hands, you know what? Don't look for vindication. Pray for repentance. Because it's the best thing for him. This God is patient. He's kind. He's slow to become angry. He's forgiving and he's gracious. And in that time, the hope is, I put you here, that maybe God would work on your heart, that you would change, and that together we could flourish in relationship. That's the goal. Now what happens is we're really talking about anger and we're talking about bitterness and a lot of us can get trapped by some of these things and I just want you to see a couple of verses that are not in this story. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 to 27. It says this, In your anger don't sin, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry and don't give the devil a foothold. And very simply put, not belaboring it, Saul was angry and he let the sun go down. It's just an a analogy of saying, he stayed in his anger. He let the anger remain. He, it stewed in him. He gave safe harbor to it, and he sat in his anger. He didn't deal with it. And as he did, it says this in verse 27, he gave the devil a foothold, which means an influence in his life. Now catch this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26 says, Escape from the trap of the devil who's taken them captive to do his will. So because of Saul's anger, he was taken captive by the enemy. And the enemy was causing Saul to carry out his purpose. Saul's no longer carrying out the purpose of God. He's carrying out the purpose of the devil because of his anger. And this is what's driving the whole thing. Watch out for it. It's a dangerous moment. In order to escape from that, take him out of your hands and put him here. Now here's the key word. David said this. In 1 Samuel 24, I'm going to let God judge between me and you. You heard that? So when he puts them over here, the word is judge. I'm going to let the Lord judge between me and you. In order to walk out of some of these places, that's a very important word for us. And I'm going to give you three things. If you are bound by anger, these three things will free you. And it, uh, it's actually pretty quick because it's all wrapped around this idea of judging. What David did is he released Saul from um, judgment. He also released um, a couple other things. So releasing people from our judgment is, is letting God be the judge between us. So when we're angry at someone, we've made a judgment against them. And we want to be the judge, the jury, the executioner. And so when we're forgiving someone, what we're doing is really releasing them from a judgment. I'm putting them in, in God's hands, and I'm releasing them. So if you want to release people, if you want to walk out of this, and there's people that wronged you, and if you need to hand them over and say, here you go, God, here's the deal. Here's a simple way to do it. God, I release so-and-so from the judgment I've made against them, that they have done this, and name whatever it is. So God, I release so-and-so, bless you. God, I release so-and-so for whatever it is that you feel like they've done against you, and I'm placing them into your hands. You'll find freedom. Because the judgment is where the, with the bondage is. We've made this judgment against them, and we can't let them go because we've made this judgment. When you make a judgment, you've got to be the judge, jury, and executioner. You've got to do all of it. So release them. Now, we have to release people, but sometimes we have to... Um, sometimes we have to actually release God. Sometimes we actually have to release God because what happens is we're angry at God because he's done something to us. Not that he's done anything wrong. It's just the way we perceive it. And in this story, here's the deal. Saul is angry at God. He's not angry at David. He's angry at God because God has taken, bless you, God has taken the kingdom out of his hands. And because he lost the kingdom, Saul becomes angry at God. He can't believe God's taken it from him. And that anger about that, he takes it out on David. That's what he's doing. For Saul to find freedom, he has to release God from the judgment that God's been unfair to him by taking it from him. Some of us have to release God from judgments we made against him. 
Some of us feel like God has done something wrong. He's been unfair to us. He's done something for someone else, but not for us. Or, or we feel like God has taken something from us, uh, whether it was our fault or not, or our sin or not. And what happens, we make a judgment against God. We want to be free from that. Saul's freedom was not forgiving David. Saul's freedom would be found in releasing God from the judgment he made against God. So sometimes we actually have to release God. So be simple. God, I release you from the judgment I've made against you, that you've been unfair to me, or something different. But I release you. And sometimes we need to release ourselves, because maybe we find that we've been the one who's been uh, doing this. And you know what happens when we become aware we've been doing this? It says that Saul wept. Do you know what Saul didn't do? Is I don't think Saul ever forgave himself for it. So he's mad at God, and now he's mad at himself. And very often we do this to ourselves when we are aware of some sins that we've committed or different things we've done, and we get convicted about things. And we do this, and we have a different name for it. It's called condemnation. And we condemn ourselves all day long. You know what you got to do? You got to release yourself. And you got to put yourself in the hands of God. And when you put yourself in the hands of God, Here's what you get. Kindness, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and love. We don't give ourselves that. But when we place ourselves in the hands of the Lord, that's what we get back. And it's an opportunity for us to be in the hands of a God who is patient, who is kind, who's forgiving, who's loving, and loved us so much that he died on the cross for ourselves and for our sins. He died on the cross and he rose from the grave conquering sin and death for us. This is how much he loves us. No matter where you are, no matter what you've done, take yourself out of your own hands, put yourself in the hands of God, and God says this, this is how much I loved you. He stretched out his arms and he died. And he rose from the grave and conquered sin and death for me and for you. And the Bible says if anyone would believe that Jesus died for us, we would be saved. We'd be saved. Don't miss the salvation of the Lord. Don't miss the kindness of the Lord. Don't miss the forgiveness of the Lord. No matter what you've done, take yourself out of your hands and put yourself in the hands of a loving God who's already paid the penalty for our sin. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? It depends. Who are you listening to? Who do you want to be? Do you believe that God be the judge between you and someone else? If you want to walk free from anger and bitterness, release a person from the judgment you made against them. Put them in the hands of God. Release God from any judgments you made against him and and let go of it. And release yourself from any judgments you've made about yourself and put yourself in the hands of a loving God. Do you see how story, when you put yourself in the shoes, when you paint the picture, you look for a principle, how it comes to life? Do you see how it actually comes into everyday life? Do you see when you ask the question, what's the story asking and answering? It becomes a very apparent what he's trying to say. If you ask that question and you begin to look for the answer through it, you'll find it. It wasn't hard to do it once you ask that question. Because if you ask the question, you start looking for the answer in the story, you'll find that what I did wasn't that amazing. It was just literally right there. I just looked for it. My goal is for you to be able to study the Bible. It's a great passage. I want us to know all the truths of the passage. But I want you to know this is how you study it, how you study story. I hope it comes to life. So in your hands is a sheet. Mark chapter 8. Do it on your own. Next week, I'll preach Mark Mark chapter 8. Let me pray for us. God, we uh, just thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you for your loving, kind, patient, forgiving. God, if there are people that we need to release to you, would you just by your spirit be moving in this room and moving online? Would you bring a loosening in our hearts that we'd be able to release people into your hands and take them out of ours? We ask that you would free us and your spirit be delivering us from a spirit of anger and of bitterness and of rage. And that through that, there would be a peace that ushers into our hearts as we release people from our hands and put them in yours. If there's someone this morning that you want to release, say something like this to God. God, I choose to release. Name the person. God, I choose to release and name them. You can do this in the quietness of your own heart. And and, and if there's that person, tell God what you're releasing them for. God, I release this person for doing this. And I place them into your hands.
maybe you find that you're really just angry at God. It's not really that God needs to be forgiven. He's good. He's perfect. But sometimes we hold on to the judgments we've made against him. Maybe you've made a judgment against God. If you have, maybe say something like this to God. God, I choose to release you from the judgment that you've been unfair to me or any other judgment you've made. And some of us need to forgive ourselves this morning. We've been hounded by condemnation. We can't believe the things that we've done, and we take it out on ourselves, and we can't figure out why we can't get it right. And we've been hounded by condemnation, and we live a life that's really marked by condemnation. If that's you this morning, just say something like this. God, I release myself from my own hands, and I place myself into your hands. May, may the Spirit of the Lord be moving to free you from condemnation this morning. That it be losing its grip. That you would find love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and faithfulness, self-control in your heart. And you find the forgiveness of the Lord. He's gracious and kind and patient. He's not condemning you. So why are you? So God, I choose to release myself into your hands. If you've never started a relationship with God, it's really easy. God has made it possible through everything that he did and nothing that you or I did. All you have to do is believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. There is a cost for sin. And the Bible says it's death. It's eternal separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life for anyone who would believe. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. And you'll find the grace, the forgiveness, and the love of the Lord. And he'll come in and start a relationship with you. If you want to do that this morning, you want to start a relationship with God, just say, hey, God, I need you. Thanks for dying for me. I've got sin in my life, and I know I'm not right before you. But thank you that you died for me, and I just receive you into my life. If you say something like that, God says his Holy Spirit will come and dwell with you and you've started an eternal relationship with him. And so may the Spirit come upon you. May he seal his work of faith. And may that relationship that you started right now grow. In Jesus' name, amen.